Welcome, everybody, to the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNYN. Thank you for watching our propaganda video. Um, <laughs> my name is Frank Henschke, and I'm the director of, of the center. And um, we do bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater, um, here uh, at the Graduate Center CUNY at this uh, um, theater laboratory living archive, um, however one uh, might uh, call it. We are very close to the PhD program in theater. So it's a great honor of, uh, for us to have one of the great American masters of uh, contemporary art with us, Meredith Monk. Thank you. Um, so it's a true honor. You know you have been here before. We showed your films. You also came to one of our site-specific conferences and other events. And then with us is Bonnie Maranka, the great PAJ editor from the performance. <laughs> Journal of Performance and Art. And um, Bonnie, as not all of you might know, actually is a graduate of the program uh, here at the uh, Graduate Center CUNY. So it's a fantastic uh, um, um, evening for us. So thank you all for coming on kind of a really snowy, cold New York day. And I know how much uh, you all have on your plate and what you do. So really coming out here tonight, it means a lot for us and it's really uh, important. And um, we do need good theater, we do need good performances, but we really need also good audiences, informed audiences. So it's a really is an honor for us that you came, but also, of course, to have one of the grandmasters <laughs> uh, 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 of the game uh, here <laughs> with us here. So um, thank you um, very much. If you have a cell phone, uh, please do take it out and make sure it says off. I'll do the same. Sound off. Yes, thank you. And um, we will have a little reception um, after uh, our talk here. So it will be structured. We'll have a conversation, a little bit with me, but mostly with Bonnie and Meredith, of course. And then um, a Q&A. But sometime, though, you also can ask uh, uh, some question. We have such a great audience, such a knowledgeable audience. So this is really a moment to really interact. We have a little reception, very short one here afterwards. And then there's a another screening in the evening, so we can't stay uh, for too long. But um, again, um, thank you for coming. And maybe we'll open up uh, the first question. So you might have to take your microphone, though not only that everybody can hear you better, we also are live streaming it and recording it with the great HowlRound um, organization, which does it nationally. So we now have over 500 videos and, and uh, 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 evenings online. It's a great archive used by scholars all around the world. And we have to least thousands of clicks. So it's an important uh, a medium that it is beyond just the room uh, that of all of you here, but truly an engagement with the art and academia and with thinking. And thinking by doing, that's what you do. But Meredith, uh, you're one of the great, great composers and singers. We've showed your films today. Why do you make films? <laughs> um, well, I, I've made films pretty much from the beginning of my work. Um, and I always thought of film as a place that can be beyond time and space. So as a live performer, I always wanted to make another dimension in the live performance. I also think of editing film like making music. In some ways, I feel like making film is like making music, like visual music. So it's been an element, like a, a layer that I've used th throughout my years of working. How did it start? What was the very first engagement? The very first film that I made was um, in a piece that was a really breakthrough piece for me in 1966, before most of you were born, um, called 16, mil mi 16 Millimeter Earrings. Which we and showed in the afternoon. Yeah, um, but the whole piece was really, in a, in a way it was a culmination of many years of thinking about how could you make a form that included these different perceptual modes within one poetic form. So, and each mode had its own integrity, but at the same time, by putting them together, it made more resonance. So in that piece, I was working with a voice, you know, that was the first time that I actu actually did like a whole score of vocal music. Um, gesture, and there was some text, but I used that in a very abstract kind of way. And then mostly visual images. And I was thinking a lot of the whole space as a kind of canvas. And that was the first piece that I used film in. And, and I used film projected in different ways on that canvas. So it was not like just a screen in the back of the space. And uh, people were working a lot with film as a backdrop. And you know, and, and, you know it was projected. And then it was projected over people. <clears throat> and, and not really thinking about weaving it as a 
as something to make another layer in a piece. So I projected in different ways, and I was working a lot with scale then. So for example, one image was a gigantic dome over my head, and my face was projected on that, and so it was very large. It was like I had a large head on a small body. So I was thinking about also things that you can't do live, like you can't do a close-up portrait in that scale in live performance except to put it onto a film or some kind of medium like that. So I was just playing with a visual sense of what live performance could be. Um, before we then come also to Bonnie, what are your very, very first things you remember ever seeing on film and who influenced you afterwards? But, but what Are is you talking to me? To you, oh. yeah. Um, what, what do you remember? As, to, oh. uh, yeah. as what is the very first Im imprint? The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> because I lived in Queens, on um, Queens Boulevard, which, and across four lanes was a Trilon movie theater. And I actually thought that people lived there that were in the movies. So I thought the witch was going to come across the street and get me. And that I re that's my, my biggest memory of film, my first memory. So I thought that all the characters lived in the movie theater. <laughs> so that's a very strong memory. But uh, um, I think a person, when I first came to New York, that I loved very much, and you know, for good reason, because I think, in a sense, she's part of a, a lineage. Uh, thinking about the arts was Maya Darren. You know, I remember her films um, when I first came to New York, and it was that displacement of time and space that was very hard to achieve on, on live performance. So one way that I was working with it, the first piece that I did in New York was called Break, and um, I was very interested in displacing techniques from one art form to another, like, you know, kind of, uh, you could say, transposing them. So I was very interested in cinematic form, like how would you do a cut in a live performance, or how would you do a wipe, or how would you do a dissolve, or something like that. And so the piece was a solo piece, but it was these very short, sharp images and gestures and characters or personae that changed instantly as if you did cut, you know, as if it was shattered glass or as if you had these film cuts. And, and that was where, you know, and, and in, a, in a sense, I was trying to do that kind of displacement of time and space with a solo figure, and what would that be? You know, I don't think I did the displacement of time and space, but it did have a certain quality because that was what I was, I was trying for. But then, I, you know, soon after that, I did see um, Meshes of an Afternoon, and there was always that sense that, you know, you could work in an environment and then shift to another environment, and, you know, literally, you know, that environment was also something that was very primary in film. You know, on stage, it's, an, it's something else. It's the room that we're in, and it's very present. But I love that, you know, I think my films, like something like Ellis Island, I think the star of the film is the place. Yeah. On how to experience it. Um, Bonnie, you are the, the founder of uh, PAJ. First, your name was uh, the, the, the Journal of Performance, and you also had performance and art. What does Meredith fit in, in your view, in the, over watching over decades, the New York scene? Where does she fit in? Where is her work situated? And, um, in film, but also performance? Uh, what a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the first time I saw Meredith's work was in the uh, early 70s, and when um, at that time, a number of people performed um, in their own homes. So it was very special. It was a piece called Anthology, uh, and Anthology Small Scroll. And Small Scroll. Anthology and Small Scroll. And I think I wrote about it for the Soho Weekly News. I was a student here at the time, and I was also writing for the Soho Weekly News. And Trisha Brown also had performances at home, and um, I guess Joan Jonas did. And uh, well, there were, there were quite a lot then. So that was actually very special. That was my first um, introduction. But, um, and I think it continues to today as well, things were quite compartmentalized and separate then, so that I considered Meredith at the time, not knowing her work so well, and just arriving in New York the year or two before, uh, more in the dance field. Um, as, as I grew as a, a, a performance historian and a researcher and editor, I came to have a much larger view of uh, her work in so many different fields. So, when you talk about um, <clears throat> her work, one has to talk about the beginnings of p performance art before the term um, came about in the 70s, um, non-narrative and abstract cinema um, of the time um, in the 60s. Um, 
also intermedia, which Dick Higgins uh, began to theorize in 1965, and then um, music theater, the development of music theater, but also um, she uses photography and drawing. I remember a piece long ago, um, Recent Ruins, that I was so intrigued by drawing in the film itself. And you can see that in Ellis Island, the use of drawing, or you can see the use of photography. So in a way, it's a, it's a kind of consummate, um, uh, it's a history of avant-garde performance, and I consider that um, that uh, Meredith has really contributed to what we understand as performance culture in New York. Thank you, um, thank you so, so very much. So um, when you were both working in New York, you as an artist, as you was right, was there like an exchange or there was that kind of a, uh, a dialogue between the genre? Did you influence each other? Is that a way, so how, how did that work at the time? What did artists? Well, I didn't really know Bonnie no, at that we time. We we, other, we met yeah. each other many years later, but I remember, yeah. I remember you more in meeting, really ha having fun with you more in the '90s, <laughs> and because I remember Gautam and Bonnie coming to uh, Politics of Quiet, which was already no 1996. Um, I mean, I was always loved P P A J, and I you know had so much respect for Bonnie as a writer and thinker, because you know we don't have so many people left that really have that depth of thought about what performance really is about, because I think it's about, it even is more, you know, it's, it goes deeper than even perception, uh, you know, but I mean, I mean, I think that, I remember Julian Beck one time introduced me in a benefit that I did with him, and he said, this is Meredith Monk, and, and the subject of her art is perception, and I was like, wow, you know, <laughs> and then I realized in some ways it is, and, but I think of perception as only the door to, you know, spiritual um, discipline or, you know, transformation. So, you know, it's really perception as a kind of steps to the, you know, it, it would be like what Al Aldous Huxley said, the threshold. Um, Meredith, uh, remember that uh, I was thinking about this during the films. In the 70s, people used the word perception a lot and consciousness and energy. Uh, those terms seem to have, um, and may, correct me if I'm wrong, but those terms seem not to be so strong in vocabulary now in terms of criticism be, be because of the way that theory and criticism have moved. But um, almost all the documents and the way that people describe their work is very much about more in the phenomenological sense of perception and um, and uh, that's why you see so much about you know the face and the hands and gesture because al also people um, you know need I think we need, all need to remember that you know the avant-garde was so new in the sense in the post-war period separating from Dada and futurism surrealism and the European avant-garde and modernism so people were just uh, beginning to create new vocabularies and and I think what you were doing was part of that creating of a kind of an American aesthetic and totally new vocabularies um, after the war. And, uh, and I, th well I, I always ha have a really hard time with the words avant-garde anyway mm -hmm. um, because I'm, I'm not sure avant of what it is because I, I think for me I feel like I'm trying to find new ways of doing things, trying to each piece I do start from uh, zero in a sense and with no assumptions or expectations and try to find something new even even though I have the backpack of my history on my back so you know we are who we are for our lifetimes but th but who we are is fluid so you know I, I like that to, I like to continue discovering as I go along and and risk so the thing is um, for me the word avant-garde makes me think more of of the 30s, 20s and 30s, early 20th century, and then that European avant-garde. So and at the same time of wanting to find something new and discovery being the source of what I do and what keeps me going in my life, I think that I, I think of circling back to the, the most ancient of times. You know, I think of time more as a, as, a, as a cycle or a circle of uncovering fundamental human energies that we all have and that we've lost so there's that sense of you know trying to affirm uh, life in you know say now in a very dark time, but you know going back to very very basic fundamental human energies. So I that's uh, so I know it's a historical term, but I have a hard time with it. Mm -hmm. I think that um, th that's another really intriguing aspect of the works, uh, looking at the films, the anachronisms, and the sense of time, time and space. Maybe you could address that. Uh, in a sense, your view of history, 
your, 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 your view of actually of time that goes back and forth in time and that encompasses all time. But basically your, your view of history, I'm interested in that. Well, um, I was also going to say something about this idea of perception also is that in some ways I feel like, this is going to sound really crazy, but I feel like I'm an artist, but I also feel that I'm sort of a philosopher. You know, I feel that my work is also has to do with the underpinnings of art or, or of a piece as much as it does the piece itself. So that's something that, you know, so that's thinking about, you know, always thinking and rethinking about what art is in relation to um, life and, um, you know, and, and the world that we live in. But in terms of time, I think that uh, I'm very aware, of, I think of time as cy cyclical mostly. And, and for, for example, a piece like Quarry, and, and you know, it, it's coming back up again. I was very interested in these, these kinds of, what would I say, the, the aesthetics of fascism and how those aesthetics recur over and over again. We're seeing it now again. And so, again, it's a perceptual thing, but it also has to do with how history continues to repeat itself. Um, with Book of Days, I was thinking about AIDS at that time, so that was in the 80s, but the plague in the Middle Ages is that same human behavior of uh, scapegoating or making people be the other. So it's more how these human things recur and how history recurs, and yet at the same time, it will always be new. The clothing of it will be new, but the underpinnings will, you know, we have similarities to people in the Middle Ages. Does that answer it or not? Uh, and then, and then also within the, it, that's the historical time. Then within a piece, I think that I, I always like to use time as a sculptural element that I can compress or I can extend and stretch and shape time within a piece. And part of the uh, my job of making a piece is to also determine what is the time um, world of that piece. Well, um, speaking of time than time in the theater and time in film. It's so, we experience it so, so, um, so differently in a way. And you already spoke a little bit about scale and the idea of the, you know, the face that you can do more with that in film. Um, but I, I want to go back to something you also said earlier um, uh, that might tie the two together, the whole question of the image. Um, you, you said you think of your films as, uh, as music. How does the image work in theater as opposed to or in relation to the difference that the, the way you conceive of the image in film with regard to being a composer? In other words, the musicality of the image that, um, you, that, you, that you speak of. Actually, I think the older I get, the less difference I see. <laughs> I think I, I work with live performance pretty much now in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, again, there's a, there's a kind of there is a, the, the, the language of film has a certain kind of fluidity that is hard to achieve on, on, on stage because stage is clunkier, you know, just by nature. You know, like one of the big decisions when, when I make a piece is, are people going to come in and out or are they just going to be there? You know, so that's, a, you know, are there going to be entrances and in, in exits or will they just be there? That's a big decision. Whereas film, that's not even a decision. You basically can cut or dissolve or, you know, you can go from one place to another fairly quickly. Um, so, uh, but I do, you know, more and more I just feel, as I've gotten older, all these elements just start to coalesce more and more because I was thinking about uh, cellular songs. I made, a, I made an installation as a kind of adjunct to the piece. Uh, the piece is very abstract and there are two large films within it, but I wanted to, I was working, you know, about, I was really working on the cell as the basic unit of life. And it's five women cast, you know, a very uh, carefully decided to have five women in this patriarchal uh, world that we're living in right now. But, you know, so my, my beloved uh, male uh, performers in my ensemble, I just say, well, you can't be in this piece, but the next one. You know, I, lo I love working with them too, but it just seemed very, very important. Um, and something I, I knew that I had not gotten into the piece was, in a sense, our DNA and that, that, that ancestral... Uh, the sense of, of the ancestral lineage of each of us. And so I did an installation where I had each of the five performers and shot very, very close. So you just saw their faces like the, the screen was their faces lined up. And we were singing one of the pieces from, from Celio's songs, which is a kind of hocket piece. A hocket is where a person just has one note. So it would be, ooh, ooh, ooh. You'd 
see it like go from face to face, what, what note they were singing, then there'd be shots of just their mouths singing it. And so you would just see that mouth singing it. And then there was a section where I, we did find all these old family photographs and, um, and you saw each line of each person, like where they came from. And then there was a section where we, we, did, we used MRIs or X-rays of the insides of our bodies. And, you know, very interested in that medical kind of aspect too. So that was, uh, I would say that that was a, it was, I don't even know whether you, you could separate music and film in that. Because we were singing the whole time and then there was an, another round that we did. So it, the music and the film was so integrated that you could never, see, you know, you couldn't pull them apart. Hmm. So that's what I'm feeling more and more, this kind of co coagulation of elements. Whereas I think my earlier work, sometimes I thought of them more as parallel lines. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at char early charts or maps, when I m make pieces, I would line up these elements, like here are all the gestural ideas, here are the, here's the, any text, here are the characters, here's the music, and you know, it would be these big charts. I think these are so integrated that it's almost like the whole thing, the whole piece is a kind of musical sculpture. Is that because you're moving more and more toward music in a way? and away from bigger spectacle? Well, I events? still love spectacle, um, you know, and I, I love scale, but uh, I think the, the music is so intricate. Mm -hmm. And so part of my um, task in the last number of years is how do I make the other elements simple enough and transparent enough that you actually hear the complexity of the music instead of the music being a kind of accompaniment? Because, you know, when you take music and if you put very uh, fancy images or movement, then suddenly the music recedes and then the, it becomes the accompaniment to what you're seeing because we are such a visual culture. So how do I even them out so that you actually, through these very transparent and simple uh, visual forms, you actually hear the, the complexity of the music? And then um, my eyes, I don't actually see three dimensions. I, I see uh, layers because I have strabismus, so I, I see out of one eye at a time. And the thing that kind of excited me about um, Celio songs was I started seeing that these forms, these musical forms, were almost like they were rotating, or they were sort of going like this. It's the first time, really, that I think I ever did this very three-dimensional kind of woven form this way instead of this kind of layers, where you hear one layer through another. And so that made me think, you know, realize that the music itself was like sculpture. And in a way, the whole piece is very architectural and very mm -hmm. sculptural. I think, Frank, you're going to say something. Um, just as a question. Sorry if I'm bla blathering no, no. off the subject no. here. Only, well, <laughs> actually, we all just want to hear from you. Yeah. That's uh, why we're here. Um, um, that if you prepare for a film, say you're going to film a work, um, there's that famous story of uh, Fritz Lang who would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and make the drawings. And when they came Do at 8 o'clock. Do it that o'clock, day? It's very day. <laughs> wow. And he once was in a car with Jean de Godard and the guy was driving around. He didn't know where to shoot the film. He had to find the right place with the cast in the yeah. van, and that drove him crazy, of course. So, but how do you do it? How do you prepare for technically? Do you have a 60 millimeter camera? Do you have it? Do you have, should you make drawings? Well, uh, how uh, does it, how is that prepared as a, a every, filmmaker? Every, every piece is different. Um, every, every film is different because A Book of Days in Ellis Island, I was shooting the 35. Um, and Book of Days was a different process than Ellis Island because Book of Days was going to be feature length film. So, I'll, I'll work backwards. For Book of Days, I worked with my dear, dear collaborator, Yoshio Yabara, who is my costume person, but we're, you know, really like two peas in a pod. And so we, I, and he's a wonderful, you know, very wonderful visual artist. And I mean, I love to draw myself, and I had drawn some preliminary um, storyboards for Book of Days. But then we just decided to sit down, and I would tell him what the scene was, and then he would draw, you know, we would just do a storyboard, and he'd say, does it look like this? No. Does it look like this? No. Does it look like this? No. And then we did a whole, st we did a, literally a whole storyboard, and which is beautiful to look at. But then when I ended up shooting in France, I mean, that, that was my... That was my structure and my, you could say, the armature. But then I would always allow if something came up at that moment to, you know, let it let it play. Very much the way that my pieces are, that they're very meticulously structured. But there's always room in the pieces to play, you know, in the moment. Um, Ellis Island, I didn't do as careful a storyboard. I really was much more being in that space and then, you know, just doing very rough drawings and then, in a way, of, it was a more intuitive process. Yeah. And then with this new one, I also did do little little drawings, 
for the for uh, um, cellular songs. Yeah. And, and do you feel that if you do perform yourself, you write the music, or you go to film, is it a continuous movement in time and space? As one, do you feel it's just one big piece you work on? Or are they um, completely different? That's are they connected? That's a very interesting question because I was thinking about that the other day. In the old days, I used to almost think of um, that. M you know, one of my pieces was, was called Juice for a good reason. That that my my work was like liquid, and that it would, and then there'd be bottles along the way, and so that liquid would go into a new bottle. And I would, and if I would had, was working on something that I hadn't really finished in my mind, that could go into the next piece. And then I went through a period now where I, I as I say, I like to start from zero and really make this um, new reality, this new world with each piece. But to be totally honest with you, in Cellular Songs, there's a, there is a historical little section from a very old piece in the 70s. So I allowed myself to pull that, again, that sort of lineage forward into this piece. Um, it's a death scene that Joe Stewart does from, it's from the Plateau series from 1978. So, uh, lately, uh, and, and you know, in a way, I also think about it a lot like a visual artist because if you look at Matisse and uh, like a retrospective of his work, what's beautiful about that is you'll see that he has an idea and it doesn't really work the first two or three canvases. That you know, you can see what the idea is, but it doesn't quite, it's not quite there. So he does 10 more and then you see it evolve and develop and bloom and then he moves on to the next idea. And so in a way, sometimes I think that there are elements in my work that are like that too, where if I'm not 100% satisfied, they worked in that context, but I feel there's more to discover, then I allow it, if it works into the next piece, I'll allow it to flow into the next piece. So, so it is one body of work. And then the other part of the question that you asked me is the performing and um, creating the work. That, that is very challenging. <laughs> it's very challenging because, you know, in, in a piece like Quarry, I gave myself a role where I just lay in the bed the whole time, and I was kind of directing by ear. So every, you know, we do Quarry. I mean, Nikki was the dictator in Quarry, and he, I, I, uh, Nikki, I, I, after the, you know, the, I, I'd be just listening to it. Maybe at the beginning of it was a, a, could be a little faster or something like that. I would literally be listening, and then I remember, like, after and write down, the, you know, the, the notes that I had. So, um... In the last years, I've been I I've just let myself be more much more integrated in the ensemble. And and then also when I was younger, I could go out and then just jump right back in and be able to perform it. Now I've got to spend a lot of time preparing for myself to perform it. Because I'm you know, a not a spring chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, it, it becomes very, very challenging. I'm glad you mentioned We're this. We're so off film, though. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can Air go back to something. Back. Um, I'm, uh, I'm glad you mentioned, though, this factor about, uh, you know, the what's saved for different things, this whole process with the liquid and um, the challenges of making work, because uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people are fixated on the meaning or a statement about work, and so much of it seems to be about solving problems or having spiritual needs and things like that. Um, I, I, was, I was going to ask you um, about um, what other kinds of freedoms do you allow yourself now? Well, I heard this great interview with Toni Morrison, and she said, I'm 80 years old, so now I'm allowed to say, uh, no, shut up, and get out. And I'm like, uh, so I'm not there yet, but boy, that's, I, I, that, that would be a really nice freedom. <laughs> okay, to go back to the films. Um, <laughs> um, they actually seem very timely, think, looking at, for example, the apocalypse theme in uh, Turtle Dreams or the immigration in um, Ellis Island. They seem very timely, and it's, how, how do they look to you now? You know, pretty much they hold up for me, you know, and, and I think that is a thing of, you know, there are some artists that are very reflective of the, uh, of the world that they live in and they become a kind of mirror of a, the time that they live in, and, then I, and that's um, very strong work. And then I think the other people that are more like me are, are trying to make a more timeless kind of art, you know, that, that, that still would apply but has a, another kind of resonance if you saw it 10 years later or something like that. And I, and I think that that's why they, hold, they seem to hold up for me. 
So, so your work is more about transcendence. Lately, though. <laughs> more about transcendence than you, you've spoken yeah. before about when you were younger, trying to lay out a political statement or a political. And yet, it was statement. always oblique. You know, I never, I never wanted to uh, be that literal about it. And so, even Quarry, which is inspired by World War II, and it, in, a, in a sense, it's a kind of meditation about mm -hmm. World War II. I think if you think it, the, the resonance is more a meditation on war. You know, on fascism, on control, on um, occupation. You know, th those were my concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, imprisonment. So you know, and that could transcend uh, World War. II, you know, the literal quality of World War II. Um, we did a piece, Specimen Days. Again, was inspired by the Civil War because I was thinking a lot the first time I went to Europe about the fact that we had never had a war in our so you know, on our soil since the Civil War and that we ha haven't been occupied yet, mm -hmm. except by Occupy now. <laughs> but um, but, but uh, so, um, and again, with the Civil War, that was pretty specific. It was called Specimen Days and also very inspired by uh, Walt Whitman's accounts of the Civil War. But in a way, I was dealing, in that piece, the outside was the Civil War, but the inside was the mentality of dualism, the mentality of, I'm me and you're the other, or you're black, I'm white, or you're red, I'm green, or you're northern, I'm southern, or you're, you, you understand, that mentality of, and, and you know, how we, how we place people in that position and categorize them, you know, I think that's really what Specimen Days was about. Mm -hmm. um, and as a question, perhaps also to, to, to young artists or people who do a work uh, or in your footsteps, yeah. what did you learn? What do you feel over time? What could you say, this is something I wish I'd known earlier, what I know now, this is what I believe um, well, we I, should, it's about what we are doing. Yeah, I wish I had been kinder to myself. You know, I, I feel like I, I wish that I had been more gentle with myself. Um, if I look back, because I look at that work and I think, my gosh, I was 23 years old and I made 60 millimeter earrings, but why did I take? Why did I not go? You're good. You're good. <laughs> or something. I don't know. You know, it was. It was. Um, you know, it's. I, on one level, I think the discipline and the rigor is really important for each person to have and to not be self-indulgent at all. And at the other, at the at the same time, you have to have the other side that's really being gentle. That's like saying, you know, just keep going, just keep going. And I think what I learned is that. And what I try to tell younger people, and you know, and the children that I work with, and uh, and younger people is, you know, the most important thing is that there's only one of you in the universe, and on you and only you have something to say. That's only what you have to say, and I don't. And I think you cannot be satisfied until you find that, and you know, don't stop short of that. But just keep going with trying to discover what that is, and it can. It doesn't even have to be in art. It can be in anything. You know, what, what are you and only you, um, what is your expression and what are you called to do in the world and with love? So I feel like, you know, the base of, of it all is love. Is that why you're, uh, you seem and to be... And that's all there is. <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, why you're, you've been so uh, happy recently to be working with children in your work? <sighs> well, I mean, they're just so great. That's why, I mean, they're so fabulous. Um, yeah, in a way, I guess, uh, you know, again, synchronicity. I, I just did a, a piece for a White Light Festival with the Young People's Chorus of New York. They did an evening of my music and then Two, three of us sang with them, so that was an incredible privilege. And Francisco Nunez is this extraordinary conductor. Kids are, he has uh, thousands of kids singing from all over the New York area, from all backgrounds, from all ethnic backgrounds, from all economic backgrounds. Um, and uh, he really is hard on them in the best sense of the word in that he will not take anything less than the best they have to give as musicians. So they're the, like top of the line, uh, you know, as musicians, and yet he's so, uh, you know, so funny and kind, and you know, he they know that he loves them to death, but he's not going to accept and you know anything but the best from them, mm -hmm. so, and they are, you know, they're just the most wonderful to be around, and you know, just so moving to be around, and then, I think that's kind of, it's 
it's sort of the synchronicity is that these last years, I think as you go along working so many years, what can, what, you know, I'm considering what do I have to leave behind and how can I pass on, oh, you know, what I've learned in my lifetime, even though, you know, just like a parent and a child, you want always, you know, you want your child not to suffer in the way that you have and it never works because they have to learn for themselves. But there are things that you can pass along and encourage this spirit of curiosity and spirit of um, adventure and, and, de and devotion, mm -hmm. which makes a very happy life. I saw for Ultimately. the first time the, the children film, the film with uh -huh, kids yeah. here. And of course, in, in your films, in Book of Days, a young girl, mm -hmm. visionary is there, and Atlas, I'm thinking of the opera Atlas, mm -hmm. there was a young girl in it, and in so many pieces. So I think it just has to do that. with the, that I feel that if all, if all of us could find, and I don't mean your, you know, your inner child, like the you know, psycho babble, but I mean the playful aspect of ourselves, the childlike aspect of ourselves, not the childish, childlike aspect of ourselves. If we all were, you know, if our society was kind of based on that, I don't think we'd be in the kind of trouble that we are in now. And so I think that the, um, the visionary kind of aspect as, as uh, and, and a sense of kind of purity of vision that children have is what I'm trying as a, a metaphor, in, as an artist, I guess, you know, as a kind of metaphor for an artist. Um, you mentioned... Um, I guess. Yeah, you mentioned before the word spiritual, I think, also yeah. used to that. I remember Judith Molina, who also was here, and uh, as someone said, you cannot even understand her without knowing she was the daughter of a rabbi. You know, um, is, is there a spirit? Is the, the, tell us about the spiritual side of your wow. your, your philosophy, uh, as you say, you are a philosopher. Which I think you're right. The current issue of the New Yorker, which actually goes into the philosophy of perception and re-evaluates that, also in the use of VR and also how to uh, uh, work with uh, artificial intelligence, how to make it so that it really kind of works uh, because it doesn't. So it's an interesting, I think, uh, current uh, magazine. But well, what would you like to know about it? I would like to know what uh, what is your philosophy of spirituality in your work as performer, singer, and filmmaker, and uh, well, um, I'm a, a Buddhist practitioner on, um, from the Tibetan lineage, and that's been for a number of years. How long? Uh, well, I taught at Naropa Institute in 1975, and that's how I kind of got pulled into it. Um, but I think that as a young artist, some of those values that I later learned were really very fundamental Buddhist principles, I think were just intuitive, intuitively principles in my artwork. So, and I would have never gotten to it except through my artwork. You know, it's like, I, because I was so um, fanatic in those days that that would be the only way that, you know, that you could knock, 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 hello, you know, art, art, okay, come in. You know? So, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I would have been open to it any other way. What are the principles? Because I was very, I was also very, um, skeptical about organized um, religion, you know, uh, or spiritual practice. But I, but I think way back to when I was uh, in college, I was, I was a Baha'i for a while. I mean, I was a, a seeker. I was a searcher for, I think, as a young person. Anyway. But you said the principles are the same. But what are the, your principles? Well, for example, fluidity of time and space, silence, um, nowness, immediacy, um, freshness, um, uh, that, that act pain, uh, pleasure and pain are pretty much one circle and neither of them are, are um, you know, to be fought or to be pushed away. Uh, within one piece could be, a, could be tra tragedy or comedy within one work, you know, not separated. Um, breath, you, you know, breath as, as a source. That's some things. And, and, and how do they space, show? Uh, space, space, space. I think space is a, you know, not, not necessarily um, literal space, but s overall space, which, you know, is something, you know, that you learn as you go along that what we think of as our, some of our ideas or our attitudes or our uh, opinions are only I ideas, attitudes, and opinions. And you actually learn how to see that's only a, a thought because there's space around it. So, you know, you, it's basic space is, and, and, and also I think another, ver you know, well, I've learned so much from uh, practice, but another thing is um, not fearing the unknown. 
because things are changing every moment anyway. So we, ha we have these fixed ideas of who we are, but we're changing every second. So that's reality. And most of our suffering comes from trying to push away from that. It's not to say that we don't have pain in our lives. Like pain is pain. And you, you know, and, and pain is painful, but the suffering from that is because we're trying to push that away as if it doesn't exist or we don't want it to exist. So I think I've, you know, I'm still working on it, but you know, I learned a lot from that. Yeah. And I try to get that into my, my work as much as I can. Yeah, I once read that the definition of Buddhism where it says it's a, a joyful participation in the sorrows of life. Yeah. And, um, yes, exactly. I, I exactly. Yeah. Very close. So how does, let's say you prepare for a show, how does a day look like in, uh, of Meredith's month? You get well, up and uh, how you... Show day? You, I, don't, I try not to do or anything. Or your rehearsals, what, or, or rehearsals. How does, if you say you practice also, how, how, does a, how, how do you go through a day? Well, I try to meditate every day. Um, in the mornings? In or the morning. But um, a half an hour or sometimes, a, you know, tw even 20 minutes. I feel... You have an it, image or music? No, or it's only just breathing. It's really, really down to earth. It's very, it's not, it's not like hoochie coochie. It's not like, oh. <laughs> you know, it's the opposite of that. It's the opposite of what people think it is. People think it's like, oh, you're going to be so blissed out and everything. Forget <laughs> about it. You're like, one, two, three, four, thinking. One, two, three. You know, it's really more just seeing, it's, it's more like just seeing how your mind is racing. It's more like waking up rather than blissing out. You know what I mean? Sure, no, I hope. I hope. <laughs> okay, yes. so you know the only so there's many many. Uh, and then you start at ten o'clock rehearsing, or how? I, usually we work in the afternoon or the evening, but let me just go back yeah. to the meditation thing. So there, there's many 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 techniques of meditation, but the basic one is um, the breath. So if 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 I was going to use that rather than counting, I would just try to concentrate on my out breath, and then I would and I thought would go bang into my mind and then the, uh, the, I the ideal, but it, sometimes it doesn't happen like for the whole half an hour, would be to see that that idea hit my mind and then I just go thinking and back to my breath again. So it's not about getting caught up in the content of the thought, it's just actually seeing the thought and the seeing the, the uh, frequencies of thoughts that it's going blah, 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 blah. I mean, my teacher sometimes said, you know, that she's gone a whole meditation time and it's just been blah, 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 blah the whole time until the gong rings and then she finally real says thinking. You know, so it doesn't, the, the content that you could be thinking that you're gonna kill your mother one thought and the next thought is I want an ice cream cone and they're sort of equal. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, it's sort of more seeing how the mind, the mind operates. So on a performance day, and, and Kirsten knows this very well. I try. I try not to do anything. That I, you know, I don't do anything. You're now, in the some, bed, like so, in query. Um. Uh, some of my performers, you know, if we we're on tour or something like that, they'll go sightseeing and everything. I just cannot. I've just got to put all my energy into that performance, and then and I'll sometimes let myself sleep late that day. I mean, I'm very very tender, you know, on, on a day of performance, and I pack all my things. Like to go to the theater very carefully, and then uh, I take about two and a half hour ritual before I go on stage. And that's just warming up. Can you up. tell a bit about that ritual? Uh, it's like warming up my voice and my body. And then it's making make it up and then, and then sometimes I uh, even sort of ask for what I would like to have happen. Like I would really like to have, be relaxed, be joyful, uh, be generous. You know, I'll say to myself, you know, what I would like to have happen. Since you spoke about breathing, are, is there anything you could say about the rhythm of breath and the rhythm of the work? Well, I mean, singing com is, you know, a direct extension of the breath. Yeah. And I think breath is, and sometimes I use the breath as a singing, uh, par, uh, you know, part of the voice. You know, uh, the, the breath itself is part of the music. Mm -hmm. the, you know, using breath as a sound. Mm -hmm. But um, do you mean in the, in the overall structure? Well, I was or? thinking, for example, you often use the lullaby or certain mm -hmm. plaintive type pieces. Are there certain meters that appeal to you more? 
that's an interesting. Well, I my early training was in Dow Crow's Eurythmics, which is a was a wonderful um, pedagogical method um, uh, developed by um, Monsieur Dacroze, who was a Swiss composer in the late 19th century, and he um, he he made a lot of music from Swiss folk music, like as Bartok was doing in in Hungary, and Kodai, and um, but he was he's also as a teacher of music in a conservatory, and he noticed that there was one particular student of his who was having a hard time with rhythm, rhythmic articulation, and but he noticed that he had a very smooth way of walking, and so he realized that if he could figure out rhythmic exercises for that young man to put into his body that he would maybe understand music and it worked. And so he, you know, Dalco said, all musical truth is contained in the body. So the three-pronged approach to his te way of teaching was number one, rhythmic training, rhythmic studies. I remember as a tiny child, you know, I started when I was three, catching balls in rhythm, you know, skipping in rhythm, you know, tasks that were in rhythm to the music. Um, second one is solfege, which is the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do system, but taught very much uh, in space, so that you know your arm would go do, re, mi, fa, to, sol, la, ti, do. So you get the idea of sound as, as space or dimension. And the third one was improvisation. So that was my early training. So I love rhythm. Rhythm is one of my favorite mm -hmm. elements. And in the Western European tradition, um, rhythmic articulation is not necessarily, particularly in the classical field, it's not necessarily like the primary element. The classical singers are, are taught much more to, uh, about line, you know, line and long phrases. So uh, as far as rhythm is concerned, I, I, there's not a particular one that I would go towards. As a matter of fact, I, I love, you know, fives and sevens and nines and, and then threes and fours and sixes and eights <laughs> and, and <laughs> yeah, so. so um, of artists or who inspire you? Who, you, who what artists do you follow? What is it? Music? Is it film? I, I'm is a it film person. person. I just tell us a little bit. Who? Do, what do you really follow? What <sighs> do you watch? What are you passionate about? Well, I see? love film. You know, I adore film. What kind of films? Uh, every every kind of film. You know, give some uh, examples. Yeah, well, I uh, you know I'm a film history kind of buff, so I just saw Usmane Sembeme, the uh, Senegalese filmmaker, one of his very early films in the 1960s called Black Girl. Did you ever see that film? <gasps> it's a beautiful film. I mean, I think he had probably seen Godard and you know the French filmmakers, but it is exquisite. Um, I mean, there's. I just love film. Period. And I, so I'm you watch more more film than theater the fil or performance. I, yeah, in a way nowadays, yes, actually, absolutely. Isn't that a terrible thing to say? No. no. Because I I do believe in live performance. I mean, I think live performance is as dinosaur as it may sound, and I am a dinosaur, but um, but it, there's something about the being in the same room at the same time, and that and that sense of touch that we get, you know, the tactility of that being in the same room at the same time that you never get in, in any other medium. I guess it's just more these days. I haven't seen things that are that inspire me too much, so then I just go back to the, my movies. So you but watch them at home, or you go to the movies? At home, theater? I go to the movies. I just went and saw uh, uh, a fantastic woman. Has anybody seen that one? That's a beautiful film. It's gorgeous. It's a Chilean film. So yeah, and I think there's some very nice films that are are, are coming out now. I like them, but I also love film history very much. I saw Judex for the first time, to yeah, last week. Have you ever seen Judex? <gasps> anybody seen Judex? Do you know what it is? No. Yes. Wow. Well, it's time we get on your right. uh, Twitter feed. So uh, what, what. But do you watch? Oh, yeah, sorry. So Judex is uh, by a filmmaker named Franck Joux, and it was early. Uh, it was France in the early 60s. But he was inspired by Fantomas. Hmm. So Fantomas was the uh, Fayad silent films of this kind of detective films from World War One, and I, I saw all of those. Even though silent film is hard because of the music they play, I have to turn it off. I can't stand listening to it. But, um, but. Um, so it is such a wonderful film, Judex. I highly recommend it. It's wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So, so do you also watch television series, these kind of long narrative forms that develop? I don't have develop? a TV, but I do love series. I'm a complete, you know, okay, you ready for this for junk? Yes. What are your favorites? Law and Order. <laughs> uh, Orange is the New Black. Homeland. And... Um, RuPaul's Drag Race. 
Wow. Well, let's, uh, since we <laughs> now have connected uh, to the audience, maybe uh, up there, uh, make a bit of light up uh, to our audience, and maybe it's time we, we, we move on. I, and I just want to mention yeah. one thing that I don't know if people realize how many filmmakers use Meredith's music. For example, uh, the recent letters from Baghdad. Uh, oh, I can't wait to see that. You, uh, I, I told you I yeah, heard I that. that. Um, and then uh, Terrence Malick and uh, the Godard, the Coen brothers. So, so your, <laughs> your music is in a lot of the films. That makes me really happy. It makes me, you know, because I think it, I think it is music that works for cinema. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe one day you develop a series and uh, a film series. And that would be for great. Netflix. Why not? Um, oh, it, might, it might work. So we uh, have an audience, Mike, also. Um, uh, with Aylida, um, uh, so um, not only that we hear uh, you better, but also because we are recording it and people uh, need to hear it. So maybe if you have a, a question or just a comment, um, uh, make sure that maybe say introduce yourself and stand up very short and try to have it as a you know comment or uh, a question, not not too long, but not too short either. So, hello, uh, thank you, thank you so much for this. This is um, a very special opportunity. Um, I'm a dance person, so I would really love to hear you talk a little bit about dance in your work and choreography and gesture and the role that that has played along with all of the film and music. Well, for, for example, in cellular songs, there is a, definitely a gestural language. Um, it's pretty pared down, as I said, because of this idea of not wanting to have the movement element take over so much that the music becomes a kind of accompaniment. So it's very carefully thought through that it is so simple and transparent, the movement. But I think that um, uh, cellular songs is very also, like you could say, the choreographic aspect is, is almost the architectural aspect, how, how the bodies are in space, which is part of choreography, you know, very a very strong part of choreography. So it's not so much huge movement vocabulary, but it's much more how the figures are in space is a very choreographed you know, and thought through kind of element. Because I think as dancers, we have, a, the, the space is something that we're just taught, it's like square one of our training, right? And, and because I came from both music and dance, it's very interesting because working, for example, with singers, like the, especially from the classical tradition, they do not have, they are not trained in space. And I always, when I teach a workshop, I always say to everybody in the class, space is your ally. <laughs> Which, you know, even the voice in space, think of the voice in space, think of the voice, uh, think of the voice pulling you, think of the voice pushing you, and, and really that, and music in space is your ally. You know, it's 360 degrees. So that's something that I, I, th I think about to this day. And I think that um, my early days of, of um, doing the deep work into my own voice as a very young person. Because I had that dance background as well, I knew how to go into a studio and work with my own voice as, as if I would be working with my body. And then also I think that they're so unified to me, you know, there's no difference. And so I was also thinking about the voice as being a very kinetic and instrument and that my music is very ki kinetic. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Hi, thank Hi. you. Um, so I'm I'm thinking about the sort of presentation of your films and some of the films that we saw today. Um, you know, weren't necessarily meant to be screened just as films, or that's, that's right. not how they were originally conceived. Yeah. So I'm I'm just curious about your what you think about showing them in this in that sort of context. Um, well, the only one, I think the only one that um, wasn't supposed. To, well, are you talking about like the face that should have been on a dome? Yeah, but actually, yeah. that the black and white face was um, on a rectangle that was in front of a table. So you know, it's pretty much the same kind of proportion. But for the the, the one that I would have probably I, I I decided to show it because it's in my short silent films. But is the ball bearing film? You know, of the bodies and the ball bearing, and that was really meant to be on a you know on a loop. You know, so and and uh, you know and. At, the, at that time, like monitors were very small, like, kind of on a small monitor, almost like it was in a room, and you just looked at it. So that's the only one where you know if it was that was not the original kind of format. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of um, installation, kind of video installation, is a really interesting. I still I love installation, 
because I love that you have that participation. So it's something I'm, you know, and I'm very, I haven't worked in film for the last few years. I'm so happy that I worked w w um, in film and in cellular songs. It feels so good to be working back in film again. Hi there. I am curious about your use of repetition. And um, in Paris, when I was watching it, I was wondering if you had a sense of the music and you were developing the movement in connection to the music, or like Martha Graham did not choreograph to music, she choreographed and created the structure of the dance and then it, it was married to music. Sometimes, uh, that's mm -hmm. not true, that's not exactly true. Well, Okay, in Merce would Merce would be more like that. Well, Hor but I, anyway, I know yeah. something about the her background. I met, with I met Louis Horton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was always so, asleep in his composition classes. He'd be fast. Right, asleep. right, right. But in any yeah. event, just in your particular yeah. case, and uh, and it may change in different pieces. But did the muse does the music generate the movement, or do they happen in some way simultaneously? And the repetition in that piece, there was one moment where I was like, you know, did she count out or is she doing it spontaneously in terms of how many times you repeated something to um, have it work? Well, I'd love to know more specifically because that's a super interesting question. I mean, I, a repetition on the overall structure with Paris, you know, was that the you first heard the music in the beginning that that what we call Paris that piano music and then it comes back and we do the dance to it and the strange thing in that one is we that's not what we you know we we didn't even use that piano piece to to work on the movement at all we use other music so it was actually pretty more pretty much like that that Paris piano music was more like a landscape or something like that so but now like for example in cellular songs there's uh, something we call Charlie that is, uh, I have the music first, and then it's loosely, the movement is loosely, you know, not, you know, not with counts and everything, but it's loosely based on the quality of that music, you know, in the new, in the new piece, Cellular Songs. And pa but Paris was more independent, actually. But a uh, question. Uh, well, the music this, this comes first, and then the movement is an extension. Uh, well, in, in Charlie, like, like a Charlie, which is just a piano piece, that's our big movement piece. Uh, that, the quality of Charlie was the inspiration for our, the movement, but it's not built in like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the way that you would, a dancer would do a choreography to a score or something like that. It's not, that's not how it, it's more like, a, like the atmosphere and then guideposts. But with Paris, I mean, I did repeat that piano piece twice in two different, you know, the first overture where you see the pian pianist playing and then that was our movement thing, you know, uh, and so that comes again. And that, that principle of bringing something back in a composition, I always find that very, very satisfying. In, sat in cellular songs, we do that click song, the I don't know if you noticed, it was very subtle, but during the second film where those big hands are coming on the screen, that's used as the track to that. So that thing where, again, it's sort of what we were talking about before, about the cycles of time, that you might not be that aware of it, but it's very satisfying when something spirals back and then comes back around again, instead of everything being one thing, the next thing, one thing. So I think it's kind of a, also a strategy of making a nonlinear kind of forms, you know, more circular kind of forms. I, I feel like I haven't quite answered your question, but, close, yeah. Close, close enough. Um, the third, there was one here, first, in the middle, who was that? Yeah. Um, I want to say thank you. I've been here since the beginning today. Oh my gosh, a marathon. And it was just wonderful. Thank you. Um, I come from a classical music and theater background. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, particularly interested in the turtle dreams, but in as well at Ellis Island. I want to tell you that the person whose hands those were is right there, Nikki Perazzo. Oh, okay. Show your hands. And his yeah. eyes, yeah. and his beautiful eyes. Um, I'm just wondering, is the choreography strictly delineated, or oh, are yeah. the performers? Now, Turtle Dreams was much more, Turtle Dreams, that was the first time I, it's sort of like, what was I thinking of? 
I was thinking it, that it's almost, um, what would I say? They're absolutely wed. You know, it's, first I just had the music, and then, and then for some reason I was in my room and I started stepping back and forth, and then I realized this is the, a, a kind of visualization of the music, and I hate that word because they're both equal, but that choreography is absolutely, it's rigorously set. Okay. You know, absolutely. So interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We would, it, you could never do it otherwise. It's so intricate. One, two. It would be really hard to do it because it's very geometric. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in that one section where we're really doing this yeah. big flaw, we, uh, uh, yeah, th those are not absolutely set. Those are, are based on each of the characters that we had. Yeah, those are, those are based on each of the characters that we had. Yeah, definitely. That, th that's right. That's right. Hi, Meredith. Um, thank you also. Is, where, where are you? I'm over here. Is oh. this on? Hello. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you about your use of humor because I know you're, you're often dealing with some very serious themes, but you always manage to insert that joyful sense of play, often in the gesture and just in so many brilliant ways. And I wondered um, what your thoughts were about that and how intentional that is or if that's just your joie de vivre. <laughs> well, what a friend we have in Mozart. You know, so in other words, I think that I would just, it would make me really sad to not have humor in a piece. I think humor is, laughter is, you know, a way of, laughter can cut through anything. And I've always been, you know, sometimes in the Western European tradition, although not Shakespeare, uh, but, you know, it's like, is it a tragedy or is it a comedy? And I've always, I just never understood that. I just feel like I'm, I, w I want the full palette of emotion in one piece. So um, I've always wanted to make sure that you had that release of laughter or that sense of, of, of humor. And, and, um, and also that sense of humor also always means, what is it? It's, there's always an observer aspect of, to humor. So it means that you're not really carried away. It, it has that lightness of touch. So I think especially when you're dealing with very serious subjects that you just have to have the, the, those moments you know, where you almost pull the lens back a little bit and you have the irony or the humor. I was thinking about, um, you know, and to me the best works have that, like um, there's a bit, you know, you, most of you know the film La Cita Aperta, which is Rossellini's film about World War II. It's, um, it is one of the most, it's such a, uh, it's a excruciatingly painful film about the occupation of Rome during World War II. I mean, torture and everything, I mean, it's excruciating. And there is a really hilarious scene in this, uh, where Ani Magnani's <coughs> a grandfather, <coughs> excuse me, grandfather um, is in a building and the, the family's in the building and the Nazis are gonna come to get them and he's yelling and groaning and screaming and she hits him over the head with a frying pan. So it's just like, bong, and you know, he's out. You know, and it, it, there's no way that you, you know, you, it's just really funny. And I, and I just thought, wow, you know, that's, you know, we have to have that that aspect in everything. I th I think. No, you're so welcome. So uh, one, two, three. Hi, Meredith. Hello. <laughs> how are you? Okay. How are you? I love you. Um, so um, I saw cellular that. songs twice. Um, got different different uh, impact each time. And I know you were saying that your intention is to create work that's timeless. Mm -hmm. However, I experience cellular songs as being very timely. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, in this world of, uh, that celebrates mediocrity, whether you are feeling lately a particular responsibility to make work that is timely. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think all artists now are trying to contend with what's going on, and you know, what do we do, um, and what's useful, and I think a lot of people feel that very, very, um, uh, what would I say, um, political, um, very directly political work, direct political work is very useful, and I think that it is, uh, you know, if you if that's what you're meant to do, and that's the way that you can express you know, truth, 
then I think that ver you know very, very political work is very important. But I think there's another branch, which is that there are some people that are thinking more in terms of a kind of antidote or a, a, the possibility of another way of doing things as a kind of antidote to the poison that's going on um, and offer an alternative. So that's what I was trying to do in Cellular Songs. But I thought really, you know, I, it took me three years to make that piece and I was really contending with how, you know, how useful is it? I mean, I feel, I'm thinking all the time about, you know, trying to make art that's useful. And I think that um, art that has, is affirming life is useful because we need that very badly, like to uh, take courage, you know, and to know that this too will pass and that we will find our way through this. And, I, and so I think that that as a kind of um, template of the possibility of generosity, kindness, collaboration, and cooperation rather than competition, you know, uh, you know, hate and um, bullying and everything else is, is really important. So that I, I was very, very aware of doing that. And Bonnie's beautiful um, uh, essay that she wrote in the program talked about that, you know, the aesthetics of what that would be. And then I think it helped people so much to I'm so grateful, Bonnie, because I, I feel that people were able to dig down into the piece deeper because they read that. Thank you, Annette. Hello. Um, I really appreciate that you're in a nonlinear, creative, kind of fertile, spacious, spiritual awareness. Um, and these are things that I personally share, and I know what it is to be in the world with those qualities. Um, I'm wondering how you relate being such a person and having such qualities um, to this culture, which is so discursive and so based on linear time um, and so organized around marshalling material resources. Um, how do you enter that fray and you know secure the funding and get the press kit done and you know make your presentation in a discursive way? Well, I actually have a wonderful team of people that I adore. Kirsten K Kapustik is the direct, director of my foundation. I have, and is Anna there? Where are you, Anna? Oh, I have the, the most, there's Anna. And then we have Peter, is Peter here? No. So we have these beautiful young people that are helping me so much more than I can think of in many, many, many years. And I think that part of it is you know, you have to, to just keep going. Um, you have to, to uh, contend with the world as it is, but I th think at the same time, you can, again, offer an alternative of, a, of even an organization as an example of how, do, how does one in this corrupt world, you know, do your work with integrity. Uh, as the Buddhists would say, right livelihood, you know, so we're not causing harm. Um, you know, there are these kinds of concerns that I think are at the basis of all of us and keep us going. Uh, but, you know, it's been a struggle for me my whole life. You know, there, it, it's never, never been easy. It's still a struggle. But in a way, uh, and sometimes it's very discouraging and very frustrating. Um, but in a way, the thing is, I would rather have my freedom. You know, I, I think I've had a, a wonderful life because I've had my freedom. And sometimes that's having your freedom is worth of not having those other things. So you just have to find your, you know, in all those resources that you have, you just have to find your way of like, you know, it's it's sort of like subverting in your own little way. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, um, and you know, subverting the culture. And then, and then the other part of it is that when w the man who has no name in this room was elected, um, <laughs> I, you know, was you know, I was uh, you know just in despair, and then there's an other part of me just said, you know I just felt the, another part of me just digging my heels in like I'm just going to dig my heels in and I'm going to continue doing my work and I'm going to be I'm going to be quietly stubborn, you know it's and but it's like more like having it's more like instead of going eh eh it's more like going mm, you know you're it's just like having a thinking about it, about it as a hum rather than as an explosion. And so, you know, and it's really, really hard, you know, and, uh, and the values are, you know, what a kind of an example do we have, you know, plus the destruction that can never be, you know, you know that, that's already 
you know, so much destruction and suffering and causing suffering. But I guess the way I feel, and this may be very naive, but I, you know, feel like art is the answer. You know, the art is the antidote. Creativity and art, any kind of, uh, or, or, or any, or, you know, good nursing or anything that comes from love. And then we're back to the Beatles again. <laughs> it, how can we, lo lo love will always win. One or two more, there he is. So back to um, some early work. I, I wondered if you would talk about ball bearing, in, in, especially in terms of uh, the discoveries you were making then and what they have to do with the discoveries you're making in your new work mm -hmm. and um, the usefulness that you think attached or you, you, whether you even thought about usefulness when you were making I'm not sure that when I was at that age, I was 24, I was <laughs> thinking about usefulness. But I was, you know, I... When I first came to New York, um, my job, I, I hated being in an office and destroyed offices. You know, one, two, three, I was like, you know, I'd, the files would be like all mixed up and everything, I hated office. So, uh, so the, what, how I earned my living was to model for artists, and, you know, artists that I respected. So I, and you know, most of my colleagues had no problem with the human body uh, at all. You know, so, uh, so um, ball bearing was really more like just making a study of, of the human body, you know, as, as kind of architecture or, uh, you know, visually. And what I was working on there was I was shooting in um, hi high eight. I had shot in, in 16. I was shooting in high eight, and then I made this crazy discovery that if you, um, if you developed high eight on a 60 millimeter stock, you got, a, a, you got, a, the screen was divided into four. And you got like those two, Im you got the four images on the screen. So it was really more like a visual discovery. And then I wanted a counter, balance to that, so I did the, in the center that little teeny ball bearing that you could see reflective. So it was more visual. I was just working with that film as a visual thing and I had already thought of it more as a kind of installation. Is and, it in and you know, and just, a, and, and let me tell you, I had this one, <laughs> oh my boy, like a, in 1969 there was a woman, Carol Russell, who I had actually adored. I, I came to adore, but she, to adore. I showed that film in this scandalous concert um, at the Billy Rose Theater, where I was called a disgrace to the name of theater, you know, uh, and uh, and um, it was I, I should have never done the you know it was a, in a series of concerts I should have said no so that you know I I know no shut up get out now from Tony Morrison but um, I should have said no then but um, so then after that which I didn't really want to do because I was already starting to work on the site specific kind of work so going back to a proscenium stage was very painful for me. So I was going to be doing a piece. Uh, first, I did a piece at the Museum of Natural History in Washington at the Smithsonian called Tour Dedicated to Dinosaurs. And that was a wonderful big piece with masses of people in it, and you know, the audience walked around. And then the second one in that series was in Chicago at the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. And this woman, Carol Russell, who was maybe in her 70s at that time, uh, was, my, you know, it was bringing me, hired me. So I remember, and she had come to the Billy Rose Theater, and so she, I remember sitting with her at her house, and she said, we're not, you know, that film, we're not ready for you yet. And I, and I don't know how I ha had the courage, and I said, Carol, it's too late. You already hired me. And then, because I said that, she just loved me, and we, and, you know, and it was very successful there, and we got to be friends for life. So even at that time, it was sort of weird. I guess frontal nudity was sort of, but as I said, I was an artist model. I mean, we never thought a second thought about it, really, you know, in those days. Will you do more installation work? <coughs> I'm working on the one for Cellular Songs, and, you know, um, I'm working on it as an installation by itself, so I'm kind of excited about that, yeah. We are coming a little bit closer to a time. We're going to have a little reception, but maybe uh, as a, a final question, what are you uh, working on now? What are your future projects for the next, I don't know, how many years? Do you plan it? Five years? Two? One? No. Uh, um, what, are, I, what are you doing? What's on your, well, in your now, book? Now we're working on um, performing cellular songs in different places. We're supposed to go to Russia um, at the end of June if, if there's any relationship between the United States and Russia by then. One of the perform wonderful performers is here, Joe Stewart, right over there from Celio Songs, um, and, um, and then some other places in the United States next fall. But um, then there's two or three projects that are happening. Then um, 
a new pro project that I've also been thinking about for a lot, many, many years, and I may actually even put some of Celia's songs within this lar even larger structure, is a piece called Indra's Net, uh, which I'm gonna do with uh, some members of um, San, San Francisco Symphony and my ensemble in, um, at Mills College. And that's more, that I'm thinking of a, as a gigantic site-specific walk-through kind of musical installation, live musical installation. And then um, the third big thing that's coming up right now is that um, Yuval Sharon, who's a wonderful young opera director uh, who's based in LA, was that uh, I did, a few years ago, I was in a, a piece of John Cage songbooks um, with San Francisco Symphony and, and Michael Tilson Thomas. I, was, I sang with Joan LaBarbera and J Jesse Norman and I were the singers. And it was really great. And Yuval was the director and he was wonderful. And um, I just love him very much. And he's a, a young, you know, really energizer bunny, young director. And um, he said that when he was in Berkeley, he listened to Atlas every night and every day. And so he said before he died, and before I died, he wanted to do his, uh, his production of Atlas, and he's going to do it. So, and uh, I'm, I'm in, you know, I went through the whole piece with him, and I'm going to be in on the casting, but that's it. Are oh, you not singing? I'm not singing neither, you know, as I said to him, you know, I don't, he said, I want you to approve everything. I was like, listen, I'd rather do my own damn production, you know, so if you're going to do your production, <laughs> tally-ho. <laughs> I, will, I will be there for the, the casting, which is really important, and I will tell you all the principles, but basically he's taking the score and we're going to see if it will be lo like La Boheme, when I'm go gone, it will still hold up or not. Yeah. And if not, that's also okay. <laughs> so. Well, um, there's a lot of things to look forward to and to join. And I saw the two assistants try a little bit when, when she said that big production site specific, uh, which you're planning. <laughs> but uh, so this is going to be a great work. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you all for coming. And congratulations. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>